God good? When is God good? All the time. Three times over. How's that? Yeah. Amen. 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 That's, that's, that's a triple blessing right there. Praise God. Good to see Brother Kane tonight. Oh, yeah. Bless you. Yeah. you know, you can't keep a good man down. Some people has got good strong legs. They ain't nothing bothering in their back. They're breathing fine. They ain't got no sniffles or nothing. They ain't even church tonight. Amen. Even somebody said, I'm going to the house of the Lord. Amen. Say out the sending of yourselves together as the man of some is. Right, yeah. So much more as they approach. I want to be in the house of God. Praise God. I love coming to the house of God. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go to the house. I'm not singing that. I'm just I'm... Let us go to the house of the Lord. I'm just kind of mm, getting the preaching though, you know? I was glad when they said unto me. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Get your Bibles out. Acts chapter 10. Where do I go? When there's nobody else to turn to, who do I talk to? When nobody wants to listen, who do I lean on? That's not me. When there's no foundation stable, I go to the rock. I know he's able, I go to the rock. Mm. Where do I go? When there's no one else to turn to, who can I talk to? When there's no one who wants to listen, who do I lean on? When there's no foundation stable, I go to the rock. I know he's able, I go to the rock. You know, I go to the rock of my salvation. Go to the storm. In verse number one of our text, 
chapter 10 and verse 1. We're going to go through these first several verses here. I want you to I want to point some things out to you. The Bible says there was a certain man yes. in Caesarea called Cornelius. Who is Cornelius? In verse number 1, it says Cornelius was a centurion of the band called the Italian band. It was spaghetti and meatballs. It was the Italian band. <laughs> he was a centurion. The centurion was a a Roman soldier who was a commander of over 100 men. I want to paint a picture of what type of man Cornelius was. This, uh, this position that he had as a centurion was not one that he bought his way into. It was not one he got because his parents were wealthy or he came from a political background. But a centurion was a soldier who had worked their way up the ranks. This was a man who was a veteran of war. He was hardened in battle. He was uh, victorious over many, uh, over many enemies. He was uh, uh, a strong man, leather skin, probably tall and athletic, and very strong built, had a solid core. Um, he was a, a man. He, he uh, was a man that had worked his way up in rank by dedication. He worked his way up in rank by courage. So this was a man who wasn't afraid to walk down the streets of Louisville uh, in the middle of the night. Right. He wasn't afraid to meet nobody in the dark alley. He was tough, tough as nails. He was a man's man. He was hardcore. And uh, he was uh, well-to-do. He, uh, as a centurion, uh, he received five to ten times more pay than the average soldier. And uh, when he walked through the streets, his presence was commanding because as a centurion, he wore one of those helmets that had the, the big red thing that went over the top. You know, like a red mohawk thing that went over the top. And uh, what was it, a plume? A plume, a plume? I don't know, it's a red mohawk looking thing. You know what I'm talking about. And he was well recognized when he walked through town. But the Bible says in verse number two that he was a devout man. He was more than just a hard soldier over uh, commanding a hundred men. The Bible says he was a devout man. This man was religious. Right. That means every Sunday morning, well, sadly unto him, he got up and went to church. Way the night, he'd show up to church. He was a religious soldier. He was a Roman. He wasn't a Jew, so he wasn't allowed in the tabernacle, but he was allowed in the, in the court of the Gentiles. And, and, and he was a supporter of of Jewish religious practices. Bible says in, chapter, in verse number 2, he was one that feared God with all his house. This man was a Roman man, but he feared God. He respected yes. and reverenced uh, God. He, he understood what Solomon meant when Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his yes. commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. He was from a Roman uh, background. And the Romans were uh, uh, sold in all kinds of gods. But this particular Roman soldier man, Cornelius, was a man that reverenced and respected yes. the God of heaven and earth. The God that we know as the creator of the ends of the earth. And this man, Cornelius, respected and feared God. Not only did he fear God, but he taught his family this. But the Bible says he feared God with all of his house. He was a man who uh, led his family. His wife and his children were also God-fearing individuals. His children grew up understanding that dad respected and reverenced God. Hey, but that lets me know that around his house, he wasn't just going around uh, filling his mouth with vulgarities. And right. he wasn't getting drunk and slamming the kids up against the wall. And, and he wasn't allowed perversion to come into the house. But he was a man who respected and feared God. Yes, yes. I will say as in verse number 22 of Acts, the Bible lets us know that he was a man of good report. Among all the nation of the Jews, of all the nations of the Jews, he was a man who was well received in the community. When he went about doing business in the community, he was a good businessman. Right, right. He wasn't down at the market. He was walking through and snatching an apple off of somebody's apple cart. 
start eating it without first giving them the quarter or the, the dollar or whatever it was to buy the apple. Yeah. He wasn't a man who walked through the market or, or lived around the community where he uh, run roughshod over everybody. And, 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 and he didn't know. Uh, when, he, when, he, when he pulled out of the parking lot, hey man, he didn't, he didn't slam it in four-wheel drive, four-wheel horse-wheel drive, and, and throw rocks over the next door neighbor's car and, and leave rocks in their yard as he pulled out in his wooden chariot. Hey man, he was a good man that was well-respected among the Jews. Yes. Right. In verse number two, the Bible says that he gave much alms to the people. He wasn't stingy. He made a lot of money. He was well-to-do. And, and he made sure that everybody received a little something along the way. Amen. If there's somebody in need, amen, Cornelius had such a good heart that he was stopped along the way. So here, let me help you out. He was very benevolent. Amen. He cared about other people. Amen. It would do us good, amen, to take a lesson from this man, Cornelius. Amen. The fear of God that gave much alms and who cared about yes. others. Amen. The, 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 the greatest commandment is this, Jesus said. Amen. To fear God. Amen. Keep His commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul. Yeah. And the second, and his like unto the first. Amen. Love thy neighbor as yeah. thyself. Yeah. Amen. You'll know how. Amen. People know that you love God. Amen. Jesus said, people will know that you love me because you love one or another. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That was Cornelius. A man who cared about others. In verse number 2 of our text, the Bible says, in the last portion of the verse, the Bible says he prayed to God always. This was a man who was devoted to prayer. Yeah. Everybody said, wow. wow. This man prayed always. Uh -huh. And that's more than some churchgoers that I know today that pray always. I hear the words of the disciples in Matthew chapter 6. And they said to Jesus these words. They said, Master, teach us to pray. Uh -huh. He said these words. He said, pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, uh -huh. hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our what? Amen. Well, if he said that, then that gives me one real good indication of what the, uh, how often the prayer should be made. Amen. Yes. Huh? Yes. As you know, but some, some people come down and pray and they say, Our Father, child in heaven, mm, hallowed be thy name. Woo! Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we pray, Lord, that you'll give us our weekly prayer. Give us our weekly prayer. Right, right. Bible says that Cornelius prayed often. And if he prayed according to Scripture, the Bible says that he would have prayed daily. Amen. I wonder if you're praying daily. Amen. I wonder if you're taking a moment of your time on a daily basis to bow your knee and let the God of heaven know, hey, God, I reverence you. I respect you. I honor you. I'm a prisoner for the blessings you pour in. Begins to recount it. 
he, he recounts it to Peter. And he says, four days ago I was fasting into this hour. Amen. I hear the words of Isaiah. Isaiah said, is this not the fast that I have chosen? Oh, man, Lord Jesus, I don't get hung up here on, on these things. Amen. Hey, but I'm going to tell you what, fasting is not just for the ministry. That's right. Amen. 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 Yes. The disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, we tried to cast this devil out. And it wouldn't listen to us. And Jesus said these words. He said, these go not but by prayer and by fasting. Amen. Amen. Want to know why you may have trouble overcoming some things in your life? Amen. Some spirits of depression that won't let you go. Addictions, uh, and the spirits are pressing you with bitterness in your heart. And why don't you try and push your complaint back? Uh, and let God deal with your heart and give you strength and power to overcome. This man Cornelius was fasting. Look at verse 3, chapter 10 and verse 3. The Bible says he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day. That's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Three o'clock in the afternoon. So this was not some late night horror movie and a three bean burrito dream that he was having. No. This was a vision that he was having. Joel said in Joel chapter 2 and, and Peter repeated in Acts chapter 2. He said your young men shall see visions and your old men shall, your young men and young women shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Uh, hey, let me tell you something. Hey, but this man Cornelius was happy a vision sent from God. Yes, that's right. Yes. And this corny, this cat is, and he's got it going on. Yes. Y'all paying attention to this guy? <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Appreciate that. <laughs> Look at verse 3. The Bible says that an angel of God visited him. How many have had a visitation with an angel? Amen. Not me. Jake is such a wonderful, wonderful yeah. man. <laughs> oh, yeah, my wife is an angel too. Man. Well, there's good angels and bad angels, you know that. I'm going to get back to the book. I need to get back to the book. I just. An angel visited this guy. I could shut it down right there and stop. Enough said. This guy has got it going on. Yeah. The angel said to, to Cornelius, Cornelius, he said in verse 4, he said, Cornelius, he said, thy prayers and thy alms have come up before God as a memorial for you. Can you imagine how much, how good that would have made you feel sure. if an angel came to you and said, hey, Brother Finney, God has heard your prayers and the givings and the offerings that you have done and the, and the benevolence you've shown others has gone up before God as a memorial and God recognizes your person. Can you imagine how awesome that would feel to be recognized by God himself sending an angel to come and share that message with me? How awesome that is. Then in verse 5, he says, Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. At the end of verse 6, he says, He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Verse 7, When the angel had spoken to Cornelius, he departed. Now, the angel comes and talks to him, and he says, Send for a man named Peter in Joppa. Now we're in Caesarea. And, 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 and so you would think by the reasoning here with all of these scriptures and all these things I've talked about with Cornelius that he was, uh, he wasn't a scaredy cat. He was tough as nails because he's a soldier, right? He was well respected in the community. He was a man that prayed all the time. He fasted. He had all these other things going on. God recognized him. And, and, and now God sends an angel to talk to him. And now he says, send for a man named Peter. In my mind's eye, I was saying to myself, well, hey, some blessings are fixing to come my way. All these things I've been doing, God recognized. 
recognizes him. And now he wants this Peter cat to come down here and tell me how awesome I am and set me up for some uh, excellent new position where I'm going to get three times the pay I'm getting now and a bigger house and a nicer car and, and a recognition uh, to let me go in the temple and celebrate with all the Jews and we're going to have a big old kumbaya. <laughs> Hold that thought right there. Look at verse 7. Watch this. And when the angel spake unto Cornelius, was, was departed, Cornelius immediately he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he declared all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. It would seem to me like it would be simple to just get one guy and say, hey, come here, servant boy or messenger, whatever. Run down there to Joppa and tell this guy to come back. But the Bible says he took two of his household servants and his devout soldier that waited on him continually. So what I'm starting to gather here, there's a little something else going on than maybe what we have already realized. Because Cornelius takes his cook and his laundry guy and his personal bodyguard and says, you guys go to chop and get Peter. I'm going to be spending some time right here waiting on y'all, but it's important. It's so important to me that you go get Peter. I can't go myself. But it's so important to me that I'm going to go without food, clean clothes, and a clean house, and my personal bodyguard. Something, something's going on. Something's going on that maybe we didn't see here the second ago. Watch this. Look at verse 22. The men made it to Cornelius' house. Uh, they made it over to Simon's house, and now they're talking to Peter. And they said, verse 22, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feared God, and of good report among all the nations of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house. Did anybody hear a warning when the angel talked a minute ago? Anybody hear a warning in the voice of the angel this minute ago? Well, evidently, something that he said to Cornelius caused him to get stirred up. Something that the angel said to him caused him to have a moment of, uh, of questioning uh, the very uh, fiber of his being. Look at verse number 24. The Bible says, And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and called together his kinsmen and his near friends. And as, as Peter came, when Peter came to the house, when Peter came to talk to Cornelius, he found a multitude of people. Cornelius recognized that there was something significant that was fixing to happen. And when Cornelius realized that something about his life was not everything it needed to be. And when Cornelius realized that as religious as he was, as the valid man as he was, as a man who gave alms, as a man who fasted, as a man who talked with angels, as a man who was a leader of other men, there was something that he realized when he listened to the Lord and the angel, hey, there's something missing in my life. And there's something important that I've got to know. And because the Bible says he was born by an angel. Get Peter down here. If you're warned of something, that means, amen, you better take caution. Amen, it means you better take heed. You better be paying attention. Amen. He said, there's something, there's something I've got to know. Amen. The angel didn't tell me what it was. Amen. But he loved me. He led me with enough, amen, fear in my heart. Amen. To recognize that if I don't get him down here, amen, I'm going to lose out. Amen. I've come to preach to somebody tonight. Amen. You need to hear what I'm fixing to preach. Amen. I'm not an angel. Amen. But I'm taking the place of Peter tonight. Amen. I've got a word from you. Amen. Are you straight from the Bible? Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Right. Here we go. From Joppa to Caesarea. It's 32 miles. Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock p.m. He gets a visitation from an angel. 3 o'clock. How long the minutes it took. He didn't say how long. As soon as the angel departed, he gathered up his cook, his butler, and his bodyguard. And sent him to Joppa, a 32 mile trek down the coast. Right. Caesarea to Joppa. Now they, they didn't have, they didn't have the Mustangs we got now. The Mustangs back then were one horsepower Mustangs. <laughs> and, and that's only if they were well to do. 
He probably didn't have a Mustang. He might have had a one hump camel, but I probably, probably didn't have a Mustang. <laughs> and so it probably took him about a day and a half, or, or best, day and a half, and that's the thing that's that stay overnight, to get to Joppa. Right. Once they got to Joppa, they had to turn around, get Peter, get all his stuff together, and they came back. Because Peter didn't come back, back by himself. There were several others that came with him. So another day and a half is journey back, time to spend all night and everything else from Wednesday night to Sunday night. Right. 64 miles. 32 one way, 32 the next. 64 miles. It's the 64 mile question. <laughs> and this strong, courageous, leader of men, manly man. Who respected God, prayed, was pious, all these things. Spent four days waiting. The Bible says he waited for Peter to come back. That word waiting is he watched. He stood, watched, waiting because he had a 64 mile question that wouldn't let him sleep. He had a 64 mile question that wouldn't let him go to bed. He had something that troubled his spirit so much because he was warned by God. You need to hear what I'm fixing to tell you tonight. Yes. Amen. Back in the 1950s, when, when TV was still at its earlier stages of its, of its popularity, and, and there was a uh, uh, the first game show that ever came on. You know, we, we know uh, Deal or No Deal. Uh, today, that's what they got. Deal or No Deal. And they got Jeopardy. <laughs> and so they, got, they, got, they got Jeopardy. And, and they got Wheel of Fortune. Dan Lifestyle was gone to do whatever they, they got. Wheel of, Wheel of Fortune. And now, what's that guy? Uh, on Price is Right. The, he used to be on uh, who's, what is this, Whose Line Is It Anyways? And now he's He's doing the Price is Right. But the, 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 the mothership of all game shows was in black and white in the 1950s. It was a show called The $64,000 Question. Anybody know that show? Amen. The premise of the show was the person would come on, they would pick a category, and they would start at $8. The first question was an $8 question. It was an easy question. They'd be like, hey, what color is the sky? Ah, oh, the sky is blue. What color is the grass? The grass is green. Feeling winner. You're an $8 winner. What color is the building you just walked into? Oh, this gray exterior with concrete. Inside is white walls and this color carpet. That we got on the Feeling you're a $16 winner. Now we move on up to $32 round. Now the questions get a little tougher. What country was Barack Obama born in? <laughs> I guess that would be one of the people who are a little higher. I'm Chris. As you made your way up, that would be As you made your way up, closer and closer to 64,000, the questions got harder. Uh -huh. The situation got more tense. There was more on the line. Because if you lost, you went home empty-handed. If you missed the question. And so now, you have this audience of people watching you that you see. And you see those eyeballs, those one-eyed eyeballs looking at you in the cameras. Where it's displaying all of your motives or all your words and all your actions for all the world to see. You sitting up there getting ready to answer a question. And now you're standing there looking at the chance of winning $64,000. That don't seem like nothing nowadays, but I'd love an opportunity to win $64,000. Yeah. Nowadays, people don't get excited unless it's 64. I ain't even going to win the lottery unless it's 64 million. $64,000. Well, I'm not playing the lottery for $64,000 or $64 million. That $64,000 is a lot of money. I'd like to have it in my hand right now. And if I was answering a question right now, somebody said, I'll give you $64,000 if you answer this question. You can bet you about a dollar. I won't be calling a lifeline. I won't be uh, uh, sweating in my hands right here. And my mouth's going to be dry. And I won't be got the shakes and everything else because, hey, man, I realize how important this question is. Right, right. Well, this ain't a $64,000 question, but this was the 64-mile question because this question was for all of our 
marvelous, honey. Hey, well, this question was a matter of not just the life and death in this world, but life and death that is to come. This was an eternal question. Hey, well, this was a question hey, well, that concerned hey, well, the eternal house uh, that he'll live in. Uh, tonight I've come to preach a 64 mile question. Hey, well, where are you going to live uh, when you take your last breath? Uh, What was the answer? Peter comes. He's now at the house. And Cornelius meets him in verse 30. Cornelius said, man, four days ago I was fasting. It was Wednesday. Now it's Sunday when you talk to me. He said, I, I, I met this guy. He said, the sin for you. He said, what should I do? What do I got to do? And answer the question, Peter. Watch this, verse 33. Immediately therefore, I said to thee, and thou stood well, thou art come. Now therefore, we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. This was not just a, an opinion right. that he was asking for. Right. He wasn't asking Peter for an opinion. Right. He was asking him for a command. Yes. Yes. When Peter recounts this tale in the chapter 11 and verse 14, he recounts the tale and this is how he said, uh, this is how his reply was. He said in verse 14, Who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Remember now, Cornelius is standing here going, I've got to be saved. I have to be saved. I was warned by God, by an angel, and I must be saved. How many must be lost? Show your hands. Anybody want to be lost? Nobody wants to be lost. How many must be saved? Oh, yes. Everybody wants to be saved. No one wants to be lost. Everybody wants GPS and how to get to heaven, right? I'm going to tell you what Peter said. This is what Peter said. He, he said, I'm going to give you a GPS unit, and this is how you get to heaven. Watch this in verse 43. To him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, that's Jesus' name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. He said, Cornelius, the way you're going to get remission of your sins is through Jesus' name. Right, that's right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Cornelius is a, a praying man. Cornelius is a religious man. Cornelius is a man who goes to church. Cornelius is a man who gives his tithes and his offerings. Cornelius is a man that visits with angels. Cornelius is a man that fasts often. And Peter's telling him he's going to need Jesus' name to get remission of sins. Because all those other things won't get you saved, friend. Right, that's right. The only saving way, neither is there salvation in the other. Acts 4 12, except the name of Jesus Christ. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation is only through one name, and that name is Jesus Christ. And if you get there by no other name, by no other method, there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There's only one way to make it. Verse 44. While Peter yet spake the words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcisions which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that of the Gentiles also were poured out in the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did they know they had the Holy Ghost? How did I know you got the Holy Ghost? Look at verse 47. They knew they had the Holy Ghost, verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Amen. You know what the evidence of you receiving the Holy Ghost is? It is speaking in other tongues. It's when you're talking the language that is not your own. It's not some humble jumble, mumbo, gumbo. No, it's when it's your voice, your vocal cords, your wind, your breath, but it's called again in the dialect. It's when you have yielded yourself to Him and to the moment of saying, God, would you live in me? Would you reside in me? I give myself to you. And in that moment of complete surrender, Him and God's Spirit will fill your body and you'll speak in a heavenly language that you and I may not recognize. But it's a language that He knows because He put it in your heart. Watch this. Remember now, this is a commandment. This wasn't a question of opinion. This was a commandment. Verse 46, they heard us speak with tongues of men by God. 
Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Listen to this, verse 48. And he asked them. No, he did not. Anybody got your Bibles out? No, he was asking. <coughs> it was an opinion. No, the Bible says that he commanded them and by the authority of the word of God and by Christ, amen, the call and the me, I command you, amen, tonight, if you are not in this place baptized in Jesus' name amen. by the authority of the word of God, amen. if you want to seek salvation, I'm telling you, amen, you must be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, amen. for the remission of sins. It is the only way to be saved. They were all baptized. <coughs> hey, Acts chapter 8. I'm going I'm I'm to get it close. I'm going to get it close and wrap it up. Acts chapter 8, verse 30. The Bible says, And Philip ran thither to an Ethiopian eunuch who was reading. And he heard him read the prophet Isaiah. And he said, Do you understand what you read? And he said, How can I? Except some man should guide me. Yes. Amen. It wasn't an angel that guided him. It was a man. Right. Amen. And the Bible says that he desired Philip that he should come up and sit with him. He read in the scriptures. And in Isaiah 53, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb dumb for his shear, so he opened not his mouth. The eunuch in verse 34 said, I pray thee, who is this prophet? Who is this God? Who is this man? And the Bible says in verse 35 that Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He preached unto him Jesus. And he preached unto him Jesus. Watch this. Verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to being baptized? I didn't hear any words in there where it said baptism. Did you? What did he preach to him? Jesus. He preached Jesus. Yeah. He, he preached what? Jesus. Friend, you can't preach. 